the fact that motion picture, from the time it was invented, the big thing about motion picture was movement, that the, the photograph didn't have movement, and suddenly you had something on screen which was moving, and therefore it was called movies or motion picture or uh, you know everything to do with movement, and that was a big delight even to see birds flying or train coming or, or whatever. But as we came, you know, like long history of cinema, and after, say, World War II, as in fact I'm citing the Lewis now, uh, it, it so happened that two great filmmakers suddenly realized, and these two great filmmakers were Bresson from France and Ozu from Japan, that they had to make the camera static. In fact, not only really static, but even make the characters most of the time sitting. So the idea of motion or movement was in fact negated. So also in Bresson, although Bresson's camera moves a little more, but it's never, it's never more than a mid-shot distance away from the characters. It has hardly one lens, 50mm. It never takes a strong angle to the subject. The scenes are not very strongly lit. It doesn't do anything that is, to my mind, visually striking. I don't think Bresson and Ozu are visual artists. That we are now, after Ozu and Bresson, we are faced with this question. We are faced with this question at how the sense of time in cinema comes only when the visual is killed. I shall tell you, for example, there are many films you will see in festivals that when you actually set up a composition, it's an image. When the audience is looking at that image, there is a certain time required to read that image. Once you have read the image, and I really mean reading in the sense, suppose I give you a static shot of anything in front of you, it has to come to an end. It has to come to an end and you have to cut it. I, the, the whole experiment of varor when somebody is sleeping for three hours is another matter. I am talking of normal filmmaking all over the world. You have to cut that image. Well, you might think that you have to cut on account of the way the narrative is developing or on account of uh, the exigencies of that particular scene. But I think that once the image is read and there is nothing anymore to read, if you hold that shot on still, then you actually confront the idea of the duration of that shot. And in order to make audience experience that duration, there are many films and filmmakers who just hold on to the image where nothing is happening, where nothing is developing further. So I would say that it is ironical, you know, and I don't mean to say that every film that has to show a, a direct experience of time must have static shots. No, that's not my, uh, my proposition is that, that that is what caused, you know, for the first time in cinema, a completely different kind of experience. <coughs> I'm talking of a different quality of attention. Because attention is not a feature of space. Attention must happen in time. The wonderful thing about film or cinema, good cinema, great cinema, is the quality of attention it evokes. That, that the kind of quality of attention a film is able to evoke is all there is to a film, as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't matter to me when I see Mizoguchi and I see Ugetsu Monogatari, you know, after about half an hour, the whole quality of attention, the internalization, it is extraordinary. It's, and where does it come from? Where does that feeling come in Ozu? Because everything is so ordinary, the characters are so ordinary, the camera is static. Where does it come from, Bresson? So my own view in this matter, as which I have not uh, included in my article, is that over the years, when you look at the history of cinema, there have broadly two kinds of films, if I may use such a broad categorization. Uh, I don't really mean to say that this is category A, this is category B, but it is to actually to enable a conversation that there has been the idea of representational film and a non-representational film. And I think that might be a platform with which we can begin to discuss. There is a big divide between the two. When Bresson, in his book, 
the notes on the Samaragrafa, says that he has given up representation and taken up fragmentation. He actually means it. And this idea of representation is so deep in us, and I include myself, that, that I think there is, I have traveled all over the world because of my profession. I have never seen a filmmaker who has achieved the quality Bresson achieved. I have never seen one. Because in the end, every film that is made outside of Bresson succumbs to the idea of representation. The idea of representation in my mind is very simple. You already have a thought, you already have an idea as to what you want to show. Therefore you shoot in a certain way and by shooting you want to accomplish that idea. You might have a narrative, but within that narrative a shot is therefore is a representation of a certain feeling, certain thought, certain idea that you might have. But as in case of Bresson, when he says that a shot is, does not represent anything. But actually when he means non-acting, there is no acting. When he says there are no parts, there are no parts. When he says that the character who is acting should not be given any intention, that means I cannot ask the character that, well, you are feeling very jealous, so you must make your face like that. Impossible. He's saying that's an impossibility in cinematography. So if you cannot give intention to the character, you cannot have characterization. So A short is nothing. On the whole, of course, Bresson saw to it that when he made the film, the character of that film, the tones of that film, you know, that he was very keen on certain kind of contrast, certain kind of uh, diffusion. Well, that's for the whole film to create, like, it's like tuning an instrument. Like the, like the musicians tune their instrument, he would also tune the camera. And then, of course, when the question of filming starts, he never directed because even, he seriously said that the point is not in directing somebody but to direct oneself. All this book is not just a collection of poetic aphorisms. It's actually true, what he says. And that is precisely the reason that people who want to follow that path, not as to copy Bresson, but to follow that tradition of presentation, they are not able to. Because they make the actors act, they make the lighting which expresses something, they choose angles that are expressive, they, in the end, succumb to the idea of the visual and representation, which is, of course, a very old tradition for humanity. The idea of representation is very, very old. The idea of fragmentation and presentation is very new. These categorizations are normally done to broadly understand, you know. So, so I would think that, for example, when I look at a work where the literal meaning of the image is abandoned, that means if I am shooting a glass and I have lit up in a way where it takes on certain metaphorical extensions, that means that one meaning that the glass has actually transforms into another meaning because I take a certain angle on the glass, the lighting is done in a certain way, the water is reflecting itself in a certain way. It means that the literal meaning of the image has been abandoned and you have gone on to an extended meaning, you know which could be described by any figure of speech. Metaphor, metonymy being uh, hyperbole, uh, hundreds of figures of speech that describe the transformation of that object into a new thing, a new metaphor. Now, the other aspect of presentation. In my mind, mind the, in the presentation, there is no extension. The literal quality of the image is accepted. A glass is a glass. So, I believe that in Bresson, a glass doesn't stand for something else, it stands for itself. When the literal meaning of an image is accepted, then how do you create meaning? Because obviously the only way that we have understood for centuries is to create metaphors and extensions that it was something being done, it actually means something else. And now you have something and I accept the literal meaning of it. How do I create meaning? I believe that when you accept the literal meaning and don't push the image into an extended meaning, then the only way you can create meaning is out of sequence. That has two possibilities. That the sequence is discernible, therefore there is a certain kind of a narrative, 
and it is because there is something now, something happening now, something happening now. So a shot, as in Besson, will mean nothing. If you look at one shot, nothing. It is, it is photographically nothing. I am saying nothing meaning it's done like that. But a shot by itself has no meaning. But when it is in sequence, and where the sequence is discernible, it is one kind, and the extreme of that would be that although it is in sequence, the sequence is not discernible. That actually it is made in a way, like in Mizoguchi, you sometimes lose the idea of the sequence. But when the literal meaning of an image is accepted, the only way out you know, for meaning to come is how shots are joined, one after the other. It is not the Einstein's idea of one plus one making two. In fact, it is ellipsis, the gap between those cuts, the gaps that are between cuts form the meaning. And I believe not just in, in visual arts, but also in literature and many other areas, the, there is a very distinct division between representation and presentation. For example, I believe that the great poetry of Basho, the haiku poet, is the kind of poetry that I also admire because uh, in the haiku, the word has no more meaning than itself. It doesn't take on metaphorical meanings in Basho. If you say an old pond, it's an old pond. It doesn't, he's not saying anything more. Then he says the frog jumps. Nothing else. Then he says the sound of splash or whatever, however you want to translate, the of water. It's because I say an ancient pond, a frog jumps, sound of water. It's because of the sequence, that suddenly a, a new experience comes into being. And this is the kind of presentation that I'm talking about, you know, that there is even in literature. But literature as cinema, as painting, is only normally only preoccupied with representation, with metaphors, metonymy. I feel as if the whole sky is coming or some you know, you know that, you know, it happens in poetry of all kinds in all languages. That's the but in to my mind Basho was Basho was exceptional. Never ever will you find in his haiku that the word that the word abandons, you know, its literal meaning and takes on an extended meaning. 